He plays on the right hand side, doesn't he? A little bit where Messi plays, of course. Yeah. We're on, we're, we're, I was going to say, are we going to do that to him? No, 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 no I'm not going to do that to him. <laughs> All of them are your kind of goals. Right, all of them are strikers' goals. Tappins you to describe them. Well, I was going to describe them in terms of intelligence, positioning, finishing. Beautifully done, If you sir. like, I can say they're all terrible goals that were tapped in and very easy. There's no such thing as a terrible goal, and they all count the same. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to The Rest is Football with uh, me, Gary Lineker. Um, I'm afraid my two co-hosts are serving a one podcast ban after another swearing episode um, just recently. I've got someone joining me today. He's a, a, a journalist. He works in Spain. Um, he writes for The Guardian, amongst other things, and hosts one of, I have to say, one of my favourite podcasts, the Spanish Football Podcast. A warm welcome um, to Sid Lowe. Um, Sid, this is a, a little bit different from us. It's it's normally the other way around. You've, you've interviewed me numerous occasions. I don't know how long it's going to take. I, what, what are you going to ask me? It better not be difficult. So I want to talk about, obviously, um, the arrival of Jude Bellingham. Um, I want to talk about um, the emergence of a, a possible young superstar in Lamine Yamal. I'd yeah. like to talk about... Um, Spanish coaches and why they're so successful in, in English football. I want to talk about Spanish players. I want to talk what happened at Barcelona. I want to talk about Messi and what happened there. So there's there's lots to go at, Sid, and you are exactly the right bloke. Good. That's that's pleasing. Thank you. I'd like to start with Jude Bellingham, actually. Mm. He's obviously emerged once again as this um, incredibly talented young player. Everyone's getting very excited uh, here in England and um, he's had a terrific start at, at Real Madrid. Um, are there... Is, as excited about him there as we are here. Yeah, I mean, that's the really striking thing. Absolutely, they are. I, I think there's a sense that he surprised everyone. Now, obviously, look, that that comes with the numbers. That comes with the fact that he's scoring uh, loads of goals. He's top scorer in Spain at the moment. He was officially player of the month in the first month in, in La Liga. But I think it's also about the character and the personality. Now, these things that we've talked about a bit in England before, but that have re been really striking in these opening weeks, in Spain, that this is someone who signs for Real Madrid at 19, is still only 20, and is playing with an authority, with an assuredness that, that I think nobody anticipated. We're not just talking mm. about good player turns up at a good club and takes control. It's player turns up at Real Madrid and takes control and appears to have a degree of leadership and hierarchy at arguably the biggest club in the world, almost certainly the biggest club in the world, and doesn't seem remotely bothered by it. Now, I think obviously you have to be careful with words like remotely bothered by it because mm. I think there is an awareness from him that this club is huge. And I think the things that he says tells you that he's trying to make sure he expresses that respect for Real Madrid at the same time as having, if you like, no respect at all for the enormity of it, not feeling at all overall by it. And that's been the most striking thing. And I know it's a cliche, but everybody keeps coming back to that. That one statistic that stands out above all else is 20. This guy is only 20. This shouldn't be happening yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, more or less. I mean, he's certainly um, ahead of his years in, in terms of maturity. But it's like you said, Sid, isn't it? He's, he's a real leader on the pitch. And he's, he's got this kind of presence that true greats will have. And it's early in his career, as you said. He's only, he's only just turned 20. So uh, there's a long way to go and things can happen in football, as, as we well know. But, I mean, it, he looks an absolute banker to be a world superstar if he's not already. Yeah, and the debate, I was actually talking to a colleague, a Spanish colleague this afternoon, and, and he already dared to utter those words. And I must admit, my head was in my hands, but at the same time, I thought, you might not be wrong. And he, he uttered the words ballon and door. And I just thought, <laughs> right, are we, are we, have we already begun this one? Yeah. Now, obviously in Spain, you know, I don't know how many of the listeners will be aware of this, but it's a real obsession, the ballon d'or here, even more so in England than it has been for a, for a very long time. But I think there is this sense that this is genuinely a special player. Now, I'm always a little bit reluctant to project onto players what they will be in three or four years' time because I think sometimes what you do is you create, if you like, a, a level that you then effectively criticise those players for if they don't reach. Whereas if, if let's say, Jude Bellingham doesn't get any better, he's still really, really good at football <laughs> and he will still be a brilliant player and it'll still be an incredible career if he stays at this level. And I think there is a risk in projecting onto him the idea that his improvement will be linear, that he'll continue to, to get better and better all the time. But that question is being asked and I think that tells you something about that. And I think you're right as well. There's something about the way that he plays 
that I think stands out. The fact that he's tall, the fact that he's elegant, the fact that he seems to stride through a midfield and, and, and uh, you know, seems to be both technically and physically mm. superior to, to a lot of the players around him has really, really made him stand out. Has his confidence surprised you? I mean, it's it's it's... It's the kind of confidence I see in, in top players. It's it's almost an arrogance in a way, and an an absolute yeah. inner belief that I am seriously good. Yeah, and I think that was expressed a little bit in. Well, I mean, it's, I know it's a it's an ongoing thing with him. This is just the way that he celebrates the goals. That 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 thing of standing in front of the fans and standing there with his arms wide. I confess, obviously, to not having seen a huge amount of him at Dortmund, so not really being aware of of that side of things. And so when you see him score at San Mamés. And for those who don't know, San Mamés Athletic Club's ground is, is known in Spain as the cathedral. There's no stadium in Spain that is as kind of immediately iconic or as immediately redolent of history and this idea that you respect this place, right? The fact that it's called the cathedral, you respect this place. And he stands there, arms wide, <laughs> and you think, all right then, <laughs> you know, you're not worried. He's at the altar with his arms wide. You're not worried about this. And, and I think that that kind of, at the risk of over symbolizing a celebration, that I think gave us this idea that, okay, here's someone who says, yeah, it's right that I'm here. It's right that I'm in control. It's right that I stand above. And I think when we've watched these games, there's a, there's a deference now to him, even from really good players, even within his own team. And I think there is very definitely that, that borderline arrogance that says, this guy is, is, is totally at ease with this. Mm. I remember playing at San Mamés myself a, a few times. In fact, one, one of the big um, kind of breaking points in, in terms of um, the Barcelona fans accepting me was, this, was a one-on-one out with the goalkeeper and we won one nil and I'd, I dinked it over the keeper. But you're right, that, that place what, to play, the atmosphere was uh, absolutely uh, incredible. But he seems unfazed by anything. Um, it's also interesting, I think, that at Real Madrid, he's almost playing, well, he's playing like a 10, isn't he? Um, as he did mm. with England um, as well. And um, when at Dortmund, he'd, he was more of a six or an eight. So it, it's interesting that he... He's so good going forward, which is, is perhaps the thing that's taken some people by surprise. Yeah. He did look like originally a kind of box-to-box midfielder, Brian Robson-esque. I've, I've been struck by that as well. Um, again, saying this without the expertise of having him watched, watched him repeatedly at Dortmund, but you get that story, that lovely story from, from when he was a kid at Birmingham, the idea that they gave him the number 22 shirt because this was a 10 who could be a 4 and an 8 as well and you add 4, 8 and 10 <laughs> up and my maths isn't great, but I believe that makes 22. He comes to Real Madrid, he gets the number 5 shirt, which, is, which of course was Zidane's shirt, albeit 5 is not a particularly redolent number, but it's Zidane's shirt. And Ancelotti decides to play him as a proper 10. Mm. Now, obviously, this is conditioned in part by the fact that they didn't get Mbappé, in part by the fact that Karim Benzema left early. So they're playing with two forwards who are not centre-forwards, with Vinicius and, and, and Rodrigo, who kind of open up and allow that extra midfielder to come through. It's conditioned by the fact that Ancelotti looks at his squad and thinks, I've got loads of great midfielders, so how do I get them all on the pitch? In part, it's by moving to from a three-man midfield to a diamond where Belling's at the top. Now, I'll be honest with you, I've watched games this year at times and thought... I'd quite like him to cover a bit more of the pitch, to be involved a little bit further back, to be able to maraud through the middle a little bit more. But he's been played close to the goalkeeper. Uh, he's been played very close to the area. It's it's really working. You look at the five goals he scored in La Liga, and all of them, well, all of them are your kind of goals, right? All of them are strikers' goals. Tappins, you put to describe them. Well, I was going to describe <laughs> them in terms of intelligence, positioning, finishing. Beautifully them. done. If you like, so. I can say they're all terrible goals that were tapped in and very easy. There's no such thing as a terrible goal, and they all count the same. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And and actually, if you look at them, there has definitely been an element of that. I don't think any of them are further out than a penalty spot. I think a couple of them are right on the edge of the six-yard box. One of them is inside the six-yard box in the 95th minute. There is this awareness. You you see the goal that he scored against Getafe. And Lucas Vazquez comes inside and takes the shot from the edge of the area. Madrid at this point, I think, had racked up 25 shots or something already. This is about the worst of them. It goes straight to the goalie. And Bellingham is already running for the loose ball before Lucas has even shot. It's not a great shot. It's a relatively easy catch. He drops it and it's in theory an easy finish. But you look at the penalty area and obviously I don't know why I'm telling you this. This is something that you you, you understand better than you're, anybody. You're telling everybody this, Sid. That's why. All that. Yeah, okay, good. That's all right. And, <laughs> and, and the people in the penalty area, no one else moves as quickly as him. No one else sees it as early as him. He's playing alongside Rossellu, who is in theory the classic number nine 
and he gets to it before Chaselu does. And, and he actually talked after the game, Bellingham, and I thought it was quite interesting about how this is, this is practice. This is mental training. This is teaching yourself to see that moment. And I personally think that in terms of his overall contribution to the game, maybe he will end up playing deeper, particularly if Madrid sign Mbappé. But at the moment, that roll off the forward, certainly in numerical terms... Is working brilliantly. Uh, it certainly is. Um, Sid, I, I saw his, I think it was his first press conference at, at Real Madrid and um, he said some nice things about you, didn't he? He says, I know you, I'm a big fan of Sid. Did, uh, to be honest, did that make you feel good? I, I, I was convinced he'd got, it was a case of mistaken identity, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm he, sure it wasn't. He had no idea who it was in the room. Yeah. Um, it was quite embarrassing, yeah. Was it? No, a little bit of yeah. you would have liked that though, weren't you? Oh, Come it's on. nice, of course it's nice. Of course it's nice, yeah, yeah, but, it, but it's also a little bit embarrassing. I, I want to go on to um, well, you, one or two other issues. Um, you talked about the obsession, actually, like with with the Ballon d'Or. Do you think that's the case in Spain because of the Ronaldo-Messi thing over the, the last 15 years or so? I think that's that's enhanced it and I think that's deepened it, but I think it goes back much further. I remember having a conversation with Michael Owen about this when Michael Owen came to Real Madrid and, and one of the key reasons, and I, I promise I'm not exaggerating this, I would say possibly the single most important reason that Real Madrid went for Michael Owen was because he was a Ballon d'Or winner. Mm. Because there was this sense that this is, this is the definition of who is the best player in the world. Bear in mind that you look at that Galactico era, it really mattered to Real Madrid that Figo won the Ballon d'Or and then Zidane won the Ballon d'Or and Ronaldo won the Ballon d'Or. This was, if you like, the, 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 the objective measure of who the best player in the world is at a time when it was a different guy each year before we got to Ronaldo and Messi and it was two guys for 15 years. Uh, and I remember speaking to Michael about it and Michael saying that when he was at Liverpool, Gerard Houllier basically had to take him to one side and say, do you not realise how big this is? Because it wasn't a thing in England. And, and, and that Houllier had to say to him, you know, from a continental point of view, this is really genuinely significant. And, and basically that the reason I bring it up is that conversation was here in Spain when he was playing for Real Madrid and essentially then led to me saying, this is everything here. <laughs> yeah, I, I, to, to, to back up Julio, this is absolutely everything. Uh, Messi and Ronaldo won a lot of Ballon d'Ors. Um, is Spanish football missing them? Yes, of course. Um, I think I think in the case of Messi, maybe a little bit more so. And, and I don't mean that in, in terms of making Messi more significant than Ronaldo. I think, I've, I think I mean that much more in terms of the way the departure happened, how how much more traumatic it seemed to be, and also that lingering kind of hope that was left there for a while. Yeah, but maybe he'll come back. So I think that kind of hurt more. I do think, though, that it's... I wouldn't say it's overcome, but I, I, I think it's... We've gone, kind of gone past it now. Yeah. Well, can you explain to our, our listeners that don't perhaps follow Spanish football quite as closely as, as, as we do, Sid, that... What happened with Barcelona? How did they get themselves in, in, into such a financial pickle, as, you, as we say? Uh, I suppose a combination of the perfect storm of mismanagement, of chasing, um, I, su I suppose it's partly pride, chasing that need to be seen as the best. And in particular, I think you look at the moment in which they, they lost Neymar and deciding that they absolutely had to do something about this and they had 220 million euros in their pocket. So it's okay, we've got loads of money. And, and it felt like they hadn't learned the lesson of history from the Luis Figo uh, saga. What happened with Luis Figo when he went to Real Madrid was Joan Gaspar, who you know very well, who was Barcelona's president at the very time. Well, yeah. Joan Gaspar had lost Figo. It's the first thing that happens to him as president of Barcelona. He thinks, I need to make amends. And he now says it himself. <laughs> I should have just said, okay, that's it. He's gone. We forget about it. We'll deal with this with time. Instead, he thinks, well, I've got loads of money and a desperate... It's where he went Exactly, though, a desperate need to go, and, <laughs> to go and fix this now. And to use his phrase, I went onto the street with loads of money. And when you go onto the street with loads of money and everyone knows you're going onto the street with loads of money, the only thing that's going to happen is you're going to get robbed. And that's basically what happened. Now, mm. it's not quite the same with the Neymar situation, but I think they could have learned a lesson from that, which is we've got 220 million euros. They've just taken our best player off, our second best player. And not just that, but Neymar was Barcelona's succession plan. He was the guy that would then take over from Messi and it was supposed to be seamless, that transition. And so they go, what do we do? We've got to buy something. And... They went out and they bought Dembélé and they bought Philippe Coutinho and they massively paid over the odds for both of them. Now, could those two players have succeeded? Yes. And maybe we wouldn't be having part of this conversation, 
but they didn't. Then they go and spend 126 million euros on Antoine Griezmann. And this was money that was unsustainable, but they could just about get away with it for as long as they were continuing to generate and continuing to be successful. Then, of course, on top of those, if you like, you've got that structural difficulty, then you get the pandemic, which comes at exactly the wrong time. Now, I 100% here do not want to blame this on the pandemic because they had made this mess for themselves. But yeah. that was, if you like, the thing that made made it properly collapse. And of course, there's nothing worse than having a massive financial crisis than everybody knowing you've got a massive financial crisis. And then, then your way out becomes even more difficult. And it was a difficult way out and it ended up being the way out um, that he didn't want for, for one Lionel Messi. Yeah, and, and that's that's the terribly tra- sad thing about all of this, of course, is that you create a situation where where you can't deal with this financial problem. And essentially the guy that has to go is the guy that officially has already gone because, of course, he hasn't got a contract because his contract was up that summer. And so you can't bring him in because the La Liga financial fair play rules mean that that it's effectively fair play in Spain to cut a very, very long and complex story short is applied in advance rather than after the event. You don't get fined for having broken the rules. You're not allowed to register players if you can't comply with them. So suddenly you've got Messi, who's officially a free agent, and the league says, well, actually you can't get him in under these rules. And so you can't, if you can't get rid of those other players, you have to get rid of the one player who you absolutely would never, ever, ever want to get rid of. And this is one of the reasons why, I, I must admit, I find myself uh, lacking patience a little bit with this discourse that you get that sometimes says, well, Barcelona never paid for their financial mismanagement. I would say that losing Messi is a fairly <laughs> heavy price to pay for it. I would totally agree on that. Uh, can La Masia save um, Barca? I mean, they're starting to a new generation of incredible young talent. It's going to have to, um, I, I think. I mean, we've had the financial um, figures put out by La Liga today. Now, it's worth pointing out that these are the figures that explain what has just happened rather than what will happen next. But, for example, Barcelona's salary limit is officially at 270 million euros. Real Madrid's is at over 700. That tells you something about the difference in they're in. Mm. Now, obviously, what Barcelona actually spend is already way over that 270. It's at 420 something, I think. So they're still having to reduce. Now, how do you do that? By bringing kids through that you don't have to pay transfer fees for, that you're not paying amortizations for, that in theory, at least to begin with, you pay relatively low salaries to, and that, that will be the way out. But... For that to be a way out in football terms is one thing. For it to be a way out in financial terms, of course, only comes through sales of those players. And that's not really what anyone wants. No, particularly a club like um, Barcelona. It, it, it brings me to um, Lamine Yamal. Um, only just turned 16. <laughs> um, starting for Barcelona. Um, creating chances and creating goals. And then becomes the youngest player to play and score for Spain. Um he looks a bit special, doesn't he? He really does. And, you know, this goes back a little bit to what we were saying about Bellingham. I'm always uneasy about projecting onto a player yeah. what he might become. I, I always feel like I don't want to be partly responsible for loading the pressure on him and maybe meaning that he doesn't succeed. And, you know, watching what's happened to Ansu Fati over the last few years, a guy who, by the way, I did load the pressure on in so much as I have any voice at all because I thought he was really, really special. Um, but... When players play this well, the pressure is kind of built by them, by their own level of performance. And and he was fantastic for Spain. I think the context for this is important. I think he was partly called up for Spain this early because he has Moroccan heritage. And I think there was a risk that that Morocco would pick him. And I think Spain wanted to make sure they got him locked in early. Um, But he then went and played these two games and started against Cyprus. And admittedly, it's against Cyprus and Spain won the game very comfortably. But he's different and he's exciting. And I think he showed that he was worth a place in the side. I'm told 357 goals in 249 youth team games over the years. Honestly, I I, I couldn't stand that figure (laughs) up for you, I'm afraid. It's quite a lot though, isn't it? (laughs) <laughs> it sounds great. It's 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 quite a lot of a lot of goals. Um, but he, he plays he plays on the right hand side, doesn't he? A little bit where Messi plays, of course. Yeah. We're on, let, I was well, going to say, gonna are go we going to do that to him? No, 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 no I'm not going to do that to him. <laughs> There's a lovely line from Bojan, Bojan Krisic, who, 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 of course, was one of these players that everybody said is going to be the next mm. big thing at Barcelona. Had extraordinary yep. figures, talking of goal-scoring runs for the youth system. I think, I think top scorer of all time in Barcelona's youth system. And I remember interviewing him when he was t- towards the end of his career. He was talking about you know, the pressure that was put on him and he actually suffered anxiety attacks at the very start of his career. And he said... Um, what I thought was a really interesting line. He said, people talk about my career 
as being a disappointment and saying I didn't achieve um, what 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 should have been achieved in this career. He said, but this depends on what career do you want? What career are you measuring my career against? And if you're measuring my career against Messi's, well, of course it was a failure. And I suppose that's... <laughs> Everyone's... <laughs> yeah, that's the pressure exactly incumbent upon us now and incumbent, I suppose, on Barcelona and on Spain and, and on and on uh, Yamal himself and everyone around him. Do not measure yourself against this guy. No, no, no definitely don't do that. Um, let's have a little breather. Welcome back to the Rest is Football uh, with, well, just me, Gary Lineker uh, this week in terms of our, our usual hosts. Um, but I have um, here with me um, Spanish football expert and uh, co-host of the Spanish football podcast and um, Sid Lowe. And Sid, um, I want to talk about why do you think Spain produces so many really good coaches? I think there are loads of, of different elements that feed into this and, and allow me to reduce this this kind of talent pool as well slightly and, and talk about another phenomenon which then expands into Spanish coaches. Go ahead. Guipúzcoa is the smallest province in Spain. It's smaller than Dorset and it provided the Premier League with Unai Emery, Julian Lopetegui, who admitted is now gone, and Donny Iraola mm. and Mikel Arteta. Juan Melillo is from Guipúzcoa and so is Xavi Alonso. We're talking about six absolutely elite managers from a province, as I say, smaller than Dorset. <laughs> it's it's absolutely tiny. And, and so some of what I'm going to give you as an answer is, is partly because I've been trying to actually answer the question of what it is that this mm. province does. And I think a lot of it is you can extrapolate it to Spain. But I think some in part it's about the participation levels anyway. I think it's partly about the nature um, of football in Spain as, as at the risk of kind of sounding overblown being a bit more thoughtful, a bit more about technification, a bit more about tactical awareness, a bit more about about understanding the kind of the mechanics. And, and that makes it slightly different from football in other countries. I think it's also about the processes of the development of youth team players going through those kind of ideas and also the development of coaches and the idea that you, this is what makes uh, a coach. I think you can see it in numbers as well. The, the number of clubs where where coaching is seen as if you like a vocation and a profession and something you do from a technical point of view, even at a relatively low level of clubs. This is a while ago now, best part of, I would say, 10 or 15 years ago, but talking to a Spanish coach and asking him about the desire to go and coach in England. And and, and I came at it from, a, I suppose, a more positive point of view, saying, well, you know, one of the things about England is maybe coaches get more time, there's more patience. Obviously, the money is is good as well. And I remember him saying, and it really struck, stayed with me, this will explain now why I haven't named him, him saying, yeah, and also the fact that our preparation, our kind of technical ability, our turning this into a profession that's about study puts us in a position where if we go to England where the culture is still not mm. that yet, puts us in a position where we are, put bluntly, much, much better. You know, the, 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 the coaching culture in England has shifted over the last 10 years, but it hasn't maybe no. gone as far yet and this goes through the federation and it goes through the clubs at Sp- in Pep Spain. Guardiola was it it wasn't Pep Guardiola it wasn't it wasn't Pep Guardiola you can't no. say oh, okay I, you I can't say tell you. <laughs> no because no, I, I'm just I'm very conscious that, that implicitly what he was saying was English coaches are rubbish well he's got he's got a point we were talking on the podcast um, just a couple of days ago after the England game or, or, and, and wondering why this country has not produced that many top level coaches I, I guess it's starting to isn't it yeah. and these are cultural things and and these are changes in the way that that that, that you work and i remember i went to see a, a friend of mine who was getting his coaching badge with the welsh fa uh, about a year or so ago and and being very conscious talking to the coaches of coaches the people teaching coaches of the way in which the game has shifted the way in which they conceptualize what it is they do has shifted that it is much more technical now that there is much more combination those kind of phrases that maybe sound a bit highfalutin but ideas of numerical superiorities and overloads and and positional play and that has shifted and that culture is changing and it's been changed i think most significantly by pep guardiola coming in at manchester city i remember when he first started and everyone's going you can't play that way with in english football it's never going to work and it and and boy has he proved us all wrong and now everybody's kind of playing that way 
or t- t- turning a little bit more in that direction anyway? There's certainly, and I think this is probably true of any pursuit, not just sport, but there's there's a cross fertilization, isn't there? And there's there's a, there's a process of, of of mixing. And I think we we talked about this a, a lot, didn't we, over the last twenty years and the kind of the the shift in English football with the arrival of foreign players who don't just bring a different um, level of player, but they bring a different type of player, a different uh, approach to training, a different approach to to maintenance, to to looking after yourself, and so on. And then that creates a wave. And then there's a second wave with coaches and I think that is filtering through now as well and, and the whole thing mm. I guess in, in, enriches us and, and that there is it is about different examples and different ideas and, and, and bringing those things together to, to create I suppose a synthesis of, of, of all of those different elements uh, You've interviewed um, all these players all these managers and over the years um, Xabi Alonso is he, did it automatically for you did you go He's going to be a coach. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I say absolutely, not necessarily with some of them, but there are yeah. some that you say, okay. Just for those that, that don't know, um, he's, at, he's at Bayer Leverkusen at the moment. Um, they had a good season last year. They went a long yeah. way in the European competition and they've, I think, I think three wins from three starts uh, this season. And playing very nice football as well. Uh, playing very, very nice football. And, 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 you know, you see it with some, you don't see it with all of them, but, but certainly uh, Xavi Alonso was, was definitely one of them. Javier Mascherano was one as well. The, the, admittedly, I'm, I'm always nervous about about um, equivalent, uh, make it, making an equivalency between the eloquence with which they talk about it mm. and their then capacity to actually do it. But you can hear, I think, sometimes in the in the capacity to explain, in the capacity to kind of cut through some of the detail, to explain the nuance that, that's really there. I remember interviewing Xabi Alonso and, and actually effectively turning the interview into, into kind of a almost a footballing manifesto based on something that really struck me when I listened to it back. And it didn't strike me quite as much doing during it, but listening to it back, it dawned on me that he'd only used, I think, something like two or three words in English during the conversation in Spanish. And of course, what tends to happen is the, the words you use in another language are the ones that culturally there's a reason why you use them in another language, or maybe because the direct equivalent doesn't exist in, in your language. Um, and one of them, I think, was Poppy, because he was talking about the the, ah. the, the controversy <laughs> over whether or not players should wear poppies. And, and, you know, there's no idea. What does this even mean in Spanish? So, so Poppy. But the one that tackling. did it was tackling. Was it entradas or uh, yeah, sort of? Well, yeah, you can use entradas. And Spaniards actually tend to use tackling. Well, they used to, I, I used to, I was quite amused when I was on the pitch and they, it was like, Corner. Um, I know it's Saka de Skinner as well, but that, you know. Yeah, and, Corner. Um, and, uh, I've, yeah. There were one or two other things that were obviously English words. Your manager would have been a mister, right? So it's because it, mister. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And, and offside was all side and stuff. And the, now those things change with time, but, but tackling is, in fairness, is kind of part of the Spanish lexicon. But what Xavi did in that interview was to talk about the idea of the concept of tackling. And he talked about how he was really struck how in England, Tackling was seen as a central part of your game, as a, as, a, as, a, as a kind of a quality. And he said he would pick up the match day program and there would be an interview with some youth team kid at Liverpool and say, what are you good at? Tackling and shooting. And now Xavi was, by the way, was prepared to admit that he could be wrong on this. But he was saying, let me explain my conceptualisation of football. And he said, in my conceptualisation of football, tackling is not a thing that you're necess- you should be necessarily aspiring to. Now, it's, 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 mm. it's a recourse uh, something you would you need at times, something you would need to take recourse to. You know? At times you will need this, but it shouldn't be something that you're aspiring to in terms of how you construct the game, how you build the game, how you play the game. And and this interview ended up being this kind of like manifesto of what it means to play football. And at that moment you think, all right, there's a coach. Now, obviously you can add with Xavi uh, that, that he has... He has mm. been with some of the greatest minds of football in football. Now, I don't mean me, obviously, here from this interview, but you know, he's he's worked under Rafa Benitez, he's worked with Mourinho, he's worked with Ancelotti, he's worked with Guardiola, he's worked with John Toshak, was the coach that was his coach when he first broke through at Real Sociedad. And he's taken things from all of them. And I think if you look at his career path, even for Shabby, who actually towards the end of his career wasn't convinced he wanted to coach, because the other thing that comes with it is all the pressure, but that those kind of intellectual building blocks were all being put into place. And what, what you're talking about, it's interesting to use the word tackling or, or, you know, whether it's a foul because no one did the tactical foul better than Xabi Alonso, did they? Uh, except possibly someone like Rodri. <laughs> and, another and he did a lot of tackling, yeah, absolutely. When I played, I mean, way back, yeah. it was really yeah. incredibly physical. They used to just kick lumps out of you. I mean, it's, it's, it, the, the game was transformed. I suppose, do you think the start of that was 
possibly Cruyff. Yeah, but there's no doubt that emotionally, I, I think tactically in the way the game is played, but emotionally what Cruyff symbolises for Barcelona is, is a revolutionisation of the game as a player when he arrives the first time in 73, but then again as a manager when, when he comes to the club. Um, <laughs> and that wasn't particularly good for you, but there's this, there's this, there's this, there's this sense that, that, that Cruyff changed that and changed, changed the, the concept of football and that it went beyond Barcelona. Obviously, it's Barcelona where they most cling to him, but it went beyond Barcelona. Now, I can almost feel the Real Madrid fans kind of grinding their teeth at the moment because that Quinta del Buitre Real Madrid team with Borja Gueno and Michel and so on was also... A- and bloody good team, unfortunately. I lost all three years to them <laughs> that I was there. They won five ti- five league titles in a row, an extraordinary team. And they, and, and they came pre-dream team so so there 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 are there are origins there even pre-Cruyff but I think Cruyff in terms of if you like the the thought process and the idealization and the creation of a I suppose a a foundational myth if you like Cruyff is 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 absolutely vital to that yeah whenever I go um, to Spain and watch watch football there which has been more frequent because I've been working for La Liga for a couple of years now doing um TV and stuff. I always find that actually when I'm there, I think there's a competitiveness about La Liga versus the Premier League. I don't know whether I'm getting that from Spain or I'm getting that from England. I I've, I, I genuinely have lost count of the number of times when I've been told. It's a farmer's league. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, do they realise how many European trophies Spanish clubs have won in the last 15 years? <laughs> and, and this exactly, and this shouldn't, shouldn't prevent us from seeing some of the flaws in the Spanish league. It shouldn't present, prevent us from talking about those economic imbalances. And you can look at the, the latest transfer window, for example, in Spain, I think are the sixth mm league in the world in terms of the amount of money spent on transfers and and that's problematic and it's worrying it's not the only measure of good football but as you say you then come back to European competition you think yeah they're doing all right really for a bunch of farmers they're doing pretty well what what games are you watching this weekend Sid? I think I will be at actually this weekend I'm quite lucky I've got three in Madrid I'll be at Rayo Vallecano at Getafe and at uh, Real Madrid I love how many games of football you go to it's too many it's uh, but it's good it can never be too much football you can't have too much football absolutely right yeah and um, let me thank you um, for coming on it's been fascinating and uh, hopefully I'm sure our listeners have enjoyed it very much a pleasure cheers Sid thanks 